All right, as I read to you, I'm going to read 1 Corinthians 3. And in this passage, I remember back during the Easter season, Palm Sunday, then Easter, last week with Pastor Steve and the Katinas, the whole bit, there was one verse that continued to echo in my heart over and over and over again. As I read this passage, see if you can't figure out just exactly which verse it is. 1 Corinthians 3, 9 through 11. For we are, God, or we are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field, God's building. By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder, and someone else is building on it, but each one should build with care, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. You know the verse, don't you? Let's pray. Lord, thank you that you have laid a foundation who is our rock, Jesus Christ. And forever, Father, we will thank you for the marvelous things you've done, for the marvelous things you're doing. And Lord, even in our weak and and sinful state, you want to do marvelous things through us. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, as you're seated, think about what God wants to do with you. You think he wants to do something? You better believe it. You know, I was thinking, honestly, this started back really around that Palm Sunday time when we start getting ready for lots and lots of even more people and I I think it's such a beautiful and powerful thing when you think about the whole Easter message we saw it once again so wonderfully Jesus loves you can you say that enough (laughs) Jesus loves me Jesus loves us and and then in this Easter it's actually my favorite of all the great holidays we have. Because when a dead guy gets up off the grave, I think that says something special. (laughs) You know, he loves us, he saves us. And like Pastor Steve said last week, he calls us. Did you catch that? And as Pastor Ross always reminds us, he's never left us alone just at that stage. And now he sends us. I want to talk to you today about what does it mean to be used by God, sent by God. And I'm interesting enough in, in leadership as we were thinking about how we want to kind of package up this somewhat of an Easter season. Obviously, interlude now, we're starting our missions and beyond that, Philippians. So this is kind of one of those nice little pockets of emphasis. We thought we should talk about stewardship, but hang on. If you've been at Calvary very long, you know we don't have the traditional view of stewardship that it's all about money and, uh, and nothing more. Our view here, it's the stewardship of life. And so I think maybe why, that's why that last verse about the foundation is always Jesus. It's what I think God was placing on my heart. So I'm going to give you this morning three truths that help me and help you to be that wise steward. Now to kind of set it up, I, I got two quick stories for you. I've titled this sermon, as you can see, Let Me Speak to the Manager. By the way, when you hear the phrase, let me speak to the manager, what do most of you think? Yeah, that's usually going to be a complaint. I mean, that's the way we think. I know that's usually, if I say that, it's not always a good thing. But I'll tell you something. When I was in high school, I grew up in junior high here in the Lyle area. We moved to Dallas when I was going into, going into ninth grade. There was a, a program on, on the WFAA, which is, excuse me, the ABC affiliate, WFAA TV. Back in the, it was back in the late 60s it actually started, ran all the way into the 80s. Some say it may well be the longest running locally produced television program in the history of American television, but it was called Let Me Speak to the Manager, and it was a program, it came on at 10.30 at night on Sunday, where the president and general manager of the ABC affiliate there in Dallas would come on and literally take any kind of question that would come in, and he would talk about television and programming and decency standards and famous people, and that's why it ran for 18 years, and it was one of those fascinating shows. Even when I was in high school, I used to think it's really it's really cool to listen to somebody who's in charge, but still he is very receptive, very open to what needs to be done. And I got to thinking, even as we got going today, I want you to think about yourself as the general manager of a business God owns. See, Mike Shapiro was his name. Mike didn't own the ABC affiliate, but he was the one who was in charge of doing what the owner wanted done. That's true for every one of us. So that's the first story. Let me speak to the manager. Here's the second one. In 1995, I left pastoral ministry and for 17 years went into the business world. I started my work in business as the executive vice president of a Christian publishing company. And my mentor in business was the owner of the company, a guy named Bill New. I I actually talked to him yesterday. As I was prepping and thinking through this message, I just felt my heart really appreciative and thankful for him and called him again yesterday. He's nearly 80 years old now. Bill was my mentor in business, and one of the first lessons he taught me 
was he said, Craig, anybody can be a good manager when things are going well. <laughs> Doesn't take a lot of skill for that. But he said, you find out what you're really made of as a manager when things are not going well, and you have to work through that. You have to make it happen, or you have to find the ways to make it happen. And then he said the second thing, I think this is probably like the second or third day on the job. <laughs> the second thing he said to me, which I still to this day do not like, and you will not like, and yet we will all agree it's true. The second thing he said about tough times, he said it's also only in the tough times we really learn how to manage. And it's not fun, but it's true, right? So this morning, as, and I've given you that first passage to kind of look at, I want to set, kind of in a, say, uh, in, a, in a way, set the stage, but maybe for some of us, reset to get you thinking about why did Jesus love you, save you, call you, and now send you? This is for every single one of us. And let me speak to the manager this morning is not a bad thing. It's a good thing. How do we do it for God? So here we go. To have a little bit of fun. You remember, I think it was about a year ago, maybe not quite, we used the text polling. Do you recall that? Well, we thought we should bring this out once in a while. So you got your phone out. Got your Who wants to play? Come on. Come on. It's not that early. All right, pull your phone out if you want to play. By the way, I know it's on stewardship. This is not a, a clandestine way for us to get more money out of you, so you can relax. Text giving goes to a completely different address. Pull your, pull your smartphone out. If you want to play, have a little fun with us here. Go to your app, okay, and go to a new message, and I want you to type in 22333, okay? You got that? Now, the message is, as you can see on the screen, Calvary Naper. Not Calvary Naperville. Somebody got that. We're trying to figure that one out. Calvary Naper. It doesn't matter if it's uppercase or lowercase, but just Calvary Naper send. It will send you a message that says you're in. All right? And once you're in, you can play. If you remember this from when we've done it before. All right. Now, here's the first question. First question is a sample question, as you can imagine. This one's for a little bit of fun, but I do think it's, yeah, let's, let's see what you think. Okay? First question. The sample question, as I said. Are you ready? This is an event that you might like to go to. You know, we like big events, right? So let's think about the next big event you might like to attend. First of all, would it be, answer number A, next opening day at Wrigley with the Cubs? All right, now don't answer too quick because i got a few more, all right? How about this one? The next playoff game with the Bulls. Coming up, right? What is it, tomorrow at 7, I think, if I remember right? Here's a third one. How many of you would like to do the next playoff game with the Blackhawks? 3 o'clock today. I'm not saying I'm going to get them for you. I'm just telling you what would you like. Here's one that will get a few groans. How about the next playoff game with the Bears? <laughs> oh, now here's, here's my personal favorite. Are you ready? The next Calvary Girlfriends Night. All right, right? <laughs> you ladies? I heard we had, by the way, over 1,000. Okay, we're well, starting to give the answers. Let's see what we got. Last night we had a lot of Blackhawks fans. Let's see, the Bulls are coming up. Poor old Cubbies, you know, no matter what you say. Wrigley Field's still great. Well, see, I just wanted you to warm you up a little bit, right? <laughs> okay, now you're set. Now you're ready to play. This first one is on this idea of stewardship. And again, think bigger than money. Money's included, yeah, but think bigger. So here we go. I'm going to give you five options. When you hear the word steward, what emotion, what idea comes to your mind first? So, so be honest. When you hear the word steward, do you think excitement? Or do you think guilt? How about boredom? No, I'm not going to let you pick more than one, okay? <laughs> How about this one, D, challenge? Do you think challenge? Or let's just be fair, do some of you take the last choice? I actually prefer not to think about this idea at all. <laughs> I'm going to be sad if that's the big one, but i got to hang on tight just in case. Wow, look at that. Most of us see this as a challenge. I'm not surprised. Are you surprised? Now, I'd like to think we'd all think of it as being exciting. I'm sorry for you guys that are already checking out. Hang with me. I'll try to get you back. Well, but the reason why I bring it up is I want you to think about it from a different perspective. Now, what was the verse that we read at the start? That key verse, that challenge verse, that powerful verse. Yeah, this is not about us. It's about Jesus. So here's the first principle. You want to be that manager for God, that steward for God. Number one is live from the foundation. Because your foundation, my foundation, it's not a what. Our foundation is a who. 
Now, what will mess up? We're just going to as people. But when Jesus is our foundation, the Bible says no one can lay any foundation other than that which is laid. Now, you know, we try to lay the foundation, but the truth of the matter is, the way by, Paul writes it there, if you, lie, if you try to lay that foundation, it's not a real foundation. Now, how many of us know that's true? It doesn't matter what you think you're doing. If you do it in your own strength, it's not going to last. It's all going to go away. That forever word we sang with Sybil and the band and the choir comes into play. Jesus is the foundation. Never let a what take the place of your who. Now, when I think about Jesus, I can, I can play a little word association. You ever play that little game where you say a word and you say the first word that comes to mind? Okay, I'm going to say Jesus is, and I want you to think about the words that pop out. Like, Jesus is Savior. Jesus is Creator. Keep going. Come on, talk to me. What else? Jesus is Lord. Jesus is? Well, yeah. Jesus is Friend. Yeah, I was hoping I'd hear that. Jesus is? Great. That'll work. Now, how long do you think we could do this? Long time, because Jesus is that great. Jesus is that powerful. Jesus is that good. He is our foundation. But let me tell you, I bet you there's a word that you will not say. We could play this for most of the morning, and I, I have a hunch you will not say something that is true. Do you know Jesus is also investor? He invests in you. He invests in me. Look at this verse. It's one you know really well. Matthew chapter 25. It's the famous parable of the talents. I won't go through the whole sermon, the whole parable, but you know the story probably. So the master gives talents. By the way, a talent here was a bag of money. And, a, and one bag of money, one talent, back in New Testament times, that some scholars say was worth 20 years' wages. So this is a lot of money. To one, he gives five bags of gold. Do the math. Another two, and then another one. So even the guy get one talent's got 20 years' money. That's pretty good, right? You could retire on that one. <laughs> So he gives them to them. The five-talent guy brings back five. The two brings back two. The one talent only brings a talent. So he didn't even get any growth. But for the first two, here's what Jesus says. This is why I know he's an investor. He says to both the five-talent and the two-talent guy, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. Notice to Jesus, a multi-gazillion dollar <laughs> investment is still a few things. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. A couple of quick thoughts. I'm not going to preach the parable, but just to remind you about this. Number one, everyone, all three of those servants represent us, and each one was capable of pleasing the Lord. Do you believe that? He would not have given them the talents. The Bible says in the story, he gave them the talents according to their ability. That means God knows what we're capable of. He never puts us in situations we can't handle, manage with his strength. It doesn't matter if it's your job or your family or your health or your finances, whatever it is, God will not put you where you are not capable of succeeding. So that's number one. Number two, I like this one a lot. Every one of them were capable of the same reward. Good, faithful servant. You get more Come share the master's happiness. What's better than that? Now, what this says to us, Jesus is the foundation. When you believe that deep in your heart of hearts, when that colors every decision, every action, every thought, Jesus believes in you. And he is not going to let you down. It's the times we look to ourselves or our situation, that's when we start to lose track. So live from the foundation. Number two, learn the skills Learn the skills of management, managing these resources. Okay, pull your phone out again. Got another te a text question for you. What skills do you feel you need most when you think about being a good steward? Okay, just open-ended. They're all good, by the way. Do you want a, the skills to be a better parent? How about a better spouse? Better time management? D is better money management. That we'll probably get a lot there. <laughs> e is ministry. Would you like some ministry skills that you don't currently have? And I left other in there just not because I'm going to ask you today, but I just got curious. I wonder, you know, how much of us are thinking about other areas. They're all good, by the way. Okay, you got an answer? A, better parent. B, better spouse. C, time. D, money, ministry, and other. 
Look at that. I'm not surprised. That actually they're spread out pretty well, but looks like money. Is, I'm not surprised. You see, even when I tell you, you don't have to just think about money when you talk about stewardship. There's still a natural, little natural bend there, and that's totally fine. In fact, I see time coming up really high. By the way, sidebar, I'm not gonna, I wasn't going to preach this, but I'll throw it in because I see those two together. Some research, recent research, Northwestern Mutual does on financial health in America found that over 60% of the Americans studied said they had problems with money management and tied it to time management. Interesting, isn't it? They do tend to go together. Okay, here's what I want you to learn. The skills. Go back to 1 Corinthians. This time I'll take you to chapter 3. Now listen to what the Bible says a little more closely here. Remember Jesus is the foundation. Paul says, what after all is Apollos and what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe. As the Lord, listen, as assigned to each his task. See, I'm managing the tasks God gives me, just like Apollos and Paul managed their tasks. And in that context, there was a little bit of debate as to kind of who is the bigger person in the kingdom. And he's saying, Paul is saying, it does not matter. He doesn't say who is Apollos. He says, what is Apollos? He doesn't say who is Paul. He says, what is Paul? And what's the answer? Servant, steward, manager, fulfiller of God's objectives okay so and he continues I love this I planted the seed Paul says I planted the seed Apollos watered it but God has been making it grow here's the key don't overthink this do we need to learn the skills yeah sure we do there's always more to learn my goodness but don't overthink it start where you are you see, God's put you in a place right now. You see, we tend to want to look off to the future. I've got as big a trouble as anybody. Look off to the future. Think about, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. Not always realizing the skill sets you need for that are oftentimes based on what you're doing right now. Are you paying attention to right now? That's why I asked you that question about those various areas. Because when you think about the personal areas of your stewardship, or I think about mine, I kind of put them into four different categories our abilities, our relationships, our time, and our money. I think those are the biggest ones that from a godly perspective and a day-to-day -day life experience, the better I am managing those resources in those four areas, the more likely I am to do what God wants me to do and accomplish his objectives. You got that? Fair enough? So when you think about it, going back to this passage in 1 Corinthians 3, planting and watering corresponds roughly to what are the things you care about? What are the things you're paying attention to? What are the areas of your life where it matters to you what's going on? And again, zoom that in toward abilities, relationships, time, and money. Because if God's going to make it grow, I just got to do what I know to do. Whatever he's already equipped me for. Now here's some examples for you, just to kind of make it a little easier. Let's start with ability. We just read about it. Jesus has already told us. The master says, if you're faithful in a few things, what do you get? You get more. This is a biblical principle. It's all over the Bible. Little leads to bigger. So if whatever it is you're looking for is not yet there, maybe the thing is where you are needs to be where your focus is. Now, when I think about ability, obviously, that can tie into lots of stuff. But don't ever believe God doesn't care about the job you have or the work that you're doing or the people you're supervising. I'll get to that in a second. Don't ever separate just because you come to church and think the only thing we think about God cares about is this church stuff. Hey, when we walk out this door, that's God's stuff. So he's put you in the job he's got you in from whether it be you know, running a company to working for yourself to teaching school to you know hourly worker who feels like your boss is a, is a bum to deal with. You know what I'm talking about, Right? You're not there by accident because God doesn't do that. Work that thinking God is there. Listen, if the Apostle Paul could say in Colossians, even to the slaves, you serve your masters as if you're serving God, what does that say to us in our world? If nothing else, it's a test. And God says, you pass the little one, you get the bigger one. That's ability. Number two is relationships. Think of two primary relationships where we have a stewardship responsibility. God's put us in places with people for reasons. So the first one would be business. It's something, by the way, it's a, it's a tremendous principle. I started doing corporate training years ago. And one of the stuff I've done a lot of things on is team building. 
But I'll, again, in many of the meetings I'm at, you've got people up and down the spectrum, direct reports, you've got supervisors, managers, directors, people working a line, whatever it is. But here's something I've said to every level and virtually every level in an organization. You need to work your team, build your team. And here's the key definition of team. Your team is anyone you depend on for your success. Quit looking at the org chart. Look around you and say, who do you need to do better? And then here's the most important question. Once you know who your team is, what are you doing to invest in your team? You try taking advantage of, let's say if you're in a supervisor role, you try taking advantage of the people that are quote unquote under you in the org chart. I hate that phrase, under you. And guess what? They're not going to bat for you. They're going to do the bare minimum. In fact, if they get half a chance, they're going to get rid of you. <laughs> and some of you know you're on the other end of it trying to get rid of somebody. I know. We've all been there. Invest in people. That's what stewardship is. Stewardship of relationships is looking for ways you can Add, you can bless, you can benefit other people. Secondary of relationships, obviously. Now, don't overthink this. It's these relationships with our loved ones, our, our mates, our kids, our grandkids, our close friends, or maybe our next-door neighbors, whoever you feel like. Again, who are you dependent on, too? And here's all, all I want to say to you. Again, as a starting point. Start where you are. Invest some time. I love this metaphor of planting and watering. You're just caring for people. One guy was reading a blog on this this past week. He was talking about the struggles, especially with husbands and wives now that are so stressed out and they come home and don't have time for kids, don't have time for each other and just kind of stumble into better, stumble onto the, you know, watch the TV or whatever. He said, we need to put a motto on our desks that says, save a little for home. That's an amen for sure. So we got abilities, you're going to steward. We got relationships, you're going to steward. How about time? The one thing we're all equal on this one, right? Time. What are you doing to manage your time? When you think about managing your time, manage it from the perspective is that you have an eternity with the foundation of Jesus Christ. Manage your time. And then number four, got to talk about money a little bit, right? Manage your money. Once again, do not overthink this. When I think about stewarding money, I think there's pretty much two places where you ought to pay attention. Number one, you need to pay attention to how you steward what you have. You know, this is something this church is very committed to. We have a very strong desire to resource and, and to provide you with classes and tools and you know, a number of things to help you, encouragement, even like today, a little slip this one in. If you don't recall, maybe you're new to Calvary, if you don't recall, last fall, Pastor Mark Bergen and I did a series on Wednesday night. It was tied in with Pastor's series on Thrive, and we actually have a website that's still up. If you go to calvaryneighborville.org forward slash thrive, you're going to find resources on that website that includes things like the, uh, the teaching that we did, even the sermon that, that we did on that. You'll find uh, websites you can look at. You'll find downloadable forms and resources. I even put the PDF copy of two of my books for free. Go on the line, download them if you're having trouble with credit card debt, if you want to know how to budget, all that kind of stuff. We have small group classes on this. The point of it is you need to take some time to learn to manage money. God's way. He's going to be with you. But you've got to decide to do it. So that's the first area. Steward whatever you have. You think, I don't have enough. Whatever amount you have, if you're here, you have something because you got here. Right? So manage it the best you can. Remember that principle? Little leads to big. So manage what you can. Start right here. And here's the second one. You know, and it's one of those areas that, again, you, don't curl your toes up on me, all right? So Relax. Because this is an invitation. I don't think you need more conviction. I think you need more inspiration. We're all fighting stuff at all times, at different places, different ways. But when it comes to giving, specifically tithing. You know, we don't teach on this heavy duty, but we like you to know the truth about tithing. And the Bible says that tithing is a tenth, giving a tenth of our income to God. The Bible tells us tithing is really a symbol of the total. So there's a sense in which you give 10%, but you're really saying, God, I'm giving 100%. That's the teaching on tithing. Now, some of you have already started going, when are we being done? I'd shut, stop that, okay? <laughs> but I, I don't know what everybody gives, but I know enough to know we don't all tithe, all right? I doesn't take a rocket scientist. I've been doing this a long time. Here's something I want to tell you, because I've been teaching and preaching on tithing nationally for over, well, pushing 20 years now. And I can tell you there's only two ways I know of that people learn to tithe. 
First of all, you got to want it, okay? So let's start there. I don't tithe because I have to. I don't tithe because somebody beat me over the head with Malachi 3. And you've not heard me preach that. You've not heard pastor preach that. You've not heard anybody from this pulpit preach that kind of foolishness. But you do hear us talk about tithing being important. So it's like I want to. If you start with the want to, I only two ways that people get there. Are you ready? Here it is. Here's the magic. The first way is they just do it. <laughs> they kind of, it's almost like closing your eyes and jumping in a cold swimming pool, right? They just start. And over the years, I've seen a lot of people do that. And I'll never discourage you from just doing it. But I'm also smart enough and been around enough to know we don't all do that. So I'm going to go back to the principle I gave you right at the start. This is the management principle of skills. Start where you are. See, what if God doesn't so much care? Novel thought. What if God so much, doesn't so much care about the amount? He just wants to see the effort. You plant. You water. You let God grow it. So I'm going to encourage you, just start to give something when you get paid. Something. As an act of faith. Don't let the devil talk, to you, talk you out of this and say, well, that's not a tithe. Or talk you out of it and say, yours doesn't matter. It's never been about the amount. Even the amount itself is a symbol of priority. Ooh, it got really quiet in here, didn't it? I don't mind if you don't. Just start where you are. Start where you are in your ability. Start where you are in those relationships. Start where you are in how you manage time. Start where you are you give and get better. Do you think God will help you get better with anything you pay attention to? Sure he will. If he's your foundation, sure, it'll happen. Let me speak to the manager. This doesn't need that to be a bad thing. And then one more. So we've got live from the foundation. Second one, learn the skills. And number three, this is fun. Love faithfully. Stewardship, management in God's kingdom is really about loving people. Loving, loving the opportunity even to love people. Listen to, uh, one more time, pull out your phones. This is your third text question of the day. This one I'll go ahead and admit to you. This one does not, it's kind of rhetorical, so there's no right or wrong. I just like for you to think about it. Question three is, it, when it comes to making a difference, where do you think most people put their efforts? Not right or wrong, just tell me where you think most people put their efforts. Okay, do they put it on their families? Do they put it on their work? Do they put it on church? Do they put it friends? Or do you think most people don't try to make a difference? I'm just curious what you think on that one. Let's just see what you say. Because it kind of speaks a little bit to our focus. All those areas are fine except for obviously the last one. But notice there are some who's, and I'm not saying you answer that for yourself, but you do recognize not everybody wants to make a difference. But notice the top two. Our families and our work. Makes sense, doesn't it? Because that's where the biggest portion of our time is. So when you think about it from that perspective, like I said a minute ago, don't overthink this. If you start where you are and then you just love faithfully, here's what you wind up with. 1 Corinthians 3, 7, and 8. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything but only God who makes things grow. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose, and they will each be rewarded according to their own labor. Now, I said Jesus is an investor, and he is, but do you notice... Most investors are looking for the result. Jesus is unusual in the fact that he's going to take care of the result, right? So what is he looking for? The effort, the labor. So here's something to help you as we close. I'll give you three B's. Are you ready? Three B's. First, number one, be a blessing. Be a blessing. Acts 20, verse 35. In everything I did, I showed you by this kind of hard work, this is Paul, we must help the weak, remembering the words of the Lord Jesus himself, who said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. That's a money context, but it's certainly broader, isn't it? I was having lunch this past week with Dr. John Spence. Dr. Spence is the son of Robert Spence, who's the previous president of Evangel. And John is now in a very significant role of leadership at Evangel and is training literally thousands of students. And, and we were just talking about what it's like helping college kids kind of get to the next level. And John told me a story I had no idea about. In fact, Pastor Mark may not know this one. He used to be a part of PTL back in the day. Jim Baker and various others, the television ministry, some of you may recall. John, his first kind of real job was as a chauffeur back at PTL. You remember, Mark? So, and he would pick up guests who literally back in, in those days, I guess it was in the 80s, that was maybe the hottest show on Christian television. And so just about anybody who was anybody or wanted to be anybody would come on that show. And John said he got this start 
that has now turned into, he's got his doctor from Missouri and, you know, in educational leadership, does lots of really, really cool stuff. But John said that was where he first started learning how to be a blessing. And he said he would pick people up at the airport, he would carry, he would open the door, he'd carry their bags, he would listen, and he would learn. But his number one objective is just be a blessing. Can you imagine what would happen to this world if all of us, 2,000 of us, decide tomorrow at work or even this afternoon with our families, I don't know what it looks like, I don't know how God's going to nudge me, but I'm just going to be a blessing. It might be a smile. You know, Jesus said if you even give a cup of cold water, you don't lose your reward. You see my point? Be a blessing. That's number one. Number two, be yourself. You don't have to be anybody else. You know, there's a famous verse that we use a lot in parenting. Proverbs 22, verse 6, you know the one? Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now, most people take that verse and apply it primarily to spiritual instruction. So you train up a child in the way he should go, i.e., the teachings of Christ, the truth of the Scripture, etc. Now, first of all, that is a very biblical concept. <laughs> you know, like Pastor talked a few weeks ago on the Shema, in Deuteronomy, you know, you're going to teach this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. You're going to teach this to your kids. Ephesians 6 says, raise up your children in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. It's all over the Bible. But in this one passage, I don't think it's about spiritual instruction. I think it's about personality. Because the Hebrew verb that's translated the way he should go literally is in his own way. In other words, your own bend, your own natural temperament and desire. And remember, the Jewish people have kind of led the world in having jobs. Have you noticed? They tend to know how to do jobs and business and things like that. So you look for people's temperaments and you tie that. Now, this is really powerful when you think about your kids. For example, I have two kids. I have a daughter who's now 29, a son who's 25, 24. And growing up, they had a hard time, like a lot of kids, figuring out what they're going to do all the way through college. My daughter got a degree in English and a minor in philosophy and didn't want to teach. Now, that's going to put you to work real quick, right? And, you know, and she, so she waited tables for, I don't know, 10 years. And I used to always try to get her to do things. I tried to get her, you know, because I was in business a lot, even ministry business as well as secular business, and it just didn't click. I hired her, you know, trying to take care of the kid. You know, I hired her, had her do work for me. Never did click, never did click. Then she, about a year and a half, two years ago, falls in love with this guy who has a business, down in the downtown, uh, down in the, uh, the Dallas area. And they got married in December. And literally two weeks ago, I was, I was here on property when I got this call from my daughter. And she says, Dad, you got a minute? I said, sweetheart, for you, I always have a minute. <laughs> and we talked for an hour and a half. And she told me about this opportunity that she and her husband have to possibly buy out a competitor in this business that they, they run. They have a CrossFit, by the way. So She's way more fit than, than I can even imagine, right? So they're into that whole scene. And so we chat a little bit. And I talked to her about not buying a visit, buying an asset. I mean, basically just kind of downloaded on her for 80, 90 minutes, right? All this stuff that I would always wanted to do. Well, she laughed. And she sent me this email. It was really fun. She sent me this email about two days later. She said, Dad, thank you for all your advice. You've really helped turn us into actual business people. And then she did a little happy face. <laughs> I just had the biggest... That just tickled me. And then I'll tell you my son. So my son also, I tried to get him into, into business with me. Didn't click, but teaching has. And now he's following kind of the footsteps really more of my wife, who's an elementary school principal. Now, here's my point. My point is let kids be themselves. Your job, my job, if I'm a dad, if you're a mom, you're a grandparent, is to coach them but not rule them. And if that's true of our kids, isn't that also true of anybody we're around? When you sense, what are you like? What's your temperament, your personality? In your own way. Let me help you. That's what godly managers do with anybody God has entrusted to your care. And how do you know? Because they're listening to you. If they're listening to you, that means God's put you there to make a difference. Be a blessing. Be yourself. And then number three, be ready for God. You never know what God's going to do when you're ready. I'll tell you something really wild. Look around this room. You see the flags of missions. Walk outside, and you're going to see them up in the, in the lobby. You'll see them in the halls. You've heard the announcement Pastor gave us about Brother Wood being here, Dr. Wood being here. You've heard the video about 200 missionaries. and You know that missions is a big deal, right? Everybody, 
We got that one, right? Either potlucks this afternoon, they're going to be phenomenal. Let me tell you something. You never know how this can happen. Never know. But what happened to me back when I was going to school, I was getting my degree in Bible and biblical languages, and I'll never forget, it was uh, actually a Greek class in the book of 1 Corinthians, oddly enough, that we're in that today. My professor, who had spent a number of years in Germany and Switzerland and Austria doing mission work, just totally out of the blue, totally out of the blue, didn't have anything to do with 1 Corinthians. He stopped and he looked at all of us, there's probably 20, 25 of us in the classroom, and he said, one of these days, you're going to have to make a decision how you will respond to the Great Commission. Matthew chapter 28, go into all the world, make disciples of all nations, just what we do, just that, right? And I remember sitting there as a junior, or senior in college, and I remember that just landing on my heart, that one way or the other, my entire life, I would either need to go or send. I would need to be a part of that. And, but it wasn't because I didn't, I wasn't pushing back against it. I, I wanted to. I just wasn't sure what that would be. Now, in my particular case, my first response to that was to go. And so I spent a summer in Korea, and I spent two years in, in Ireland. And since that time, I've been able to serve short-term in Greece, in Slovenia, in Mexico. Even this most past uh, recent fall, I had a chance to do some work in Singapore. And, you know, so missions, and obviously being here at Calvary Church, is a big deal with missions. But let me tell you something that was the aha that hadn't struck me like it did when I was thinking about you guys in our, in our sermon this morning. My decision to take mission seriously, which in and of itself, that's good enough, but my decision to take mission seriously is what led me to take a course, a literally a three-week course at Abilene Christian University on my way to the mission field in Ireland, and there was this really pretty 20-year-old young lady named Karen sitting next to me who I did not know, but who had gone, had lived in Ireland as a little kid. We connected. Long story short, she is now my wife of 33 years. And my decision that started with just simply saying yes to God on missions, it ultimately led me to Lubbock, get my doctorate at Texas Tech, led me into business opportunities. I wouldn't know Pastor Ross if it wasn't for that one yes as a junior in college simply responding to the Great Commission. Now, are all decisions like that? No. No. But guess what? You never know which ones will. So get in the habit of saying yes to God, even if you don't know what it looks like. Because when we're ready for God, you think he's not already ready for us? Absolutely. We're going to pray, and then Pastor Steve is going to lead that Angel Army song in just a second. But before we do... I know the Holy Spirit. He talks to us all. He talks to us. We don't even know sometimes it's Him. But I have a strong sense in my spirit this morning that each one of you have some area of your life as a manager, as a steward, that God is talking to you and He's touching and He's saying, here's an area I want to help you be better at. You know what I'm talking about? I'm going to lead us in prayer. Not to make a big show out of this, but I do want you to raise your hand if there's some area. Maybe it's abilities. Maybe it's relationships. Maybe it's time or money. I don't know. Maybe it's a mission's decision. I don't know. It doesn't matter because this is between you and God. The point is not what it is. It's who is your foundation. As I pray, if that's something that you want a special touch from the power and presence of God today, we're going to pray and we're going to believe that God will direct your steps. That's in his word. And then we're going to march out of here knowing the God of angel armies is on our side. Are you ready? Let's pray. Lord, as hands are raised, as our hearts are open, our desire, Lord, is to follow you. Lord, as you speak to us as your managers, your general managers of the work you've given us to do on this earth, Father, I pray you will prepare and equip and empower each one of us, that you'll open and close doors that you'll soften hearts where that needs to happen, whether it's in our own or other people, that you will give us a new measure of effectiveness and favor to walk in your paths, to do your things, your ways. And Lord, we thank you that you're with us, that you say yes, that you are our God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.